in uh, the photography business, if I, my customers had a disapproval of a photo of themselves, uh, I always had a ready reply. If you want a better photo, get a better face. <laughs> I never said that. I would have them come in, I would sit down in front of a computer and open up the picture, and I would do whatever they wanted with it. I had a lady one time, this has nothing to do with the sermon, she was an author, and she actually wrote, uh, she was an RN, but she wrote a book on um, cardiac nursing, it was a textbook for the, for the nursing schools. She had a picture taken for that, and, I, and she, she was kind of serious, and she didn't like her smile. But, so she didn't smile in the pictures, and so we sat down, opened the computer up, and she said, well, I like that one right there, but I wish I had a little bit more of a smile. So I just pulled the corners of her mouth up in Photoshop, and it was perfect, and she was happy as could be. Her son plays a banjo in the in the uh, in bluegrass band Mama Corn, if you ever heard of them, heard of them. He's the banjo player, mandolin too. Sometimes Psalm 40 begins with a song of thanksgiving. It goes like this, verse two: He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. Would you bow your heads with me, dear Lord? We thank you this morning that you lift us out of all kinds of things, Lord. And we appreciate and acknowledge that all, all good things that we have come from you, Lord. So we ask you to bless this word to our very spirits. In Jesus' name, amen. So David declares his trust in God to deliver him out of his troubles, just as the Lord has done in the past, where he says, he drew me up from the pit of destruction, this is in the ESV version, out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. Different uh, translations describe that with different words. His situation had been so dire and so dangerous that he describes it as a pit of destruction in the NIV, the slimy pit, or the pit of despair in the, that's in the NLT. He was struck so deep in the miry, stuck so deep in the miry bog in the ESV or the mud and mire in the NLT that on his own, David was powerless to get free. But when he called on the Lord for help, God intervened, rescuing David. He pulled David up out of the desolate pit of engulfing mire, quicksand, mud, and set his feet upon a rock. God set his feet on the rock. He's quick to admit, David is, that he's unable to extricate himself from the mire, from this goo, from this muck. Have you ever been there? He's probably not talking about physical muck. He's talking about things that are going on in his life. Probably you have been there. Things going on, you just can't see through. How are you going to get out of this? Maybe you were in a mire and didn't even know it, and Jesus brought you out of it anyway. There are all kinds of slimy pits. There are all kinds of mud and mire. I was in quicksand once. I told you guys that. I was in, maybe that was before you two started coming here. I was in a quicksand. I went in there on purpose. The, up, at Bear, up in Bear, you didn't know there was quicksand in Pennsylvania. Up in Bear Creek, which is in, I think, Elk County. 
And there's a wire. It's a trout chip. There's a wire across. It says danger quicksand. There's a wire across. You're not supposed to go in there. And as you get close to that wire, the rocks are a little like spongy. There's rocks there, but it feels like there's a mattress down under there. And you're not supposed to go past that wire. So I went around on the side and the bank was a grassy bank there and my buddy was with me and I said hang on to me I'm going to step into the quicksand and see what that's like I got up to my knees and I was sinking and he pulled me out of there so I just wanted to have that experience to say that I was actually in quicksand because most people that get into quicksand they're not able to tell it because they're dead <laughs> I don't know how far that would have gone but it was uh I could see I couldn't extricate my own self from there. But some of these mud and mire things that we get into are not physical. Fear is a pit. Fear keeps us from reaching our potential for God. Isaiah 41 10. So do not fear for I am with you. Do not be as dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. It was fear that led David into sin. First, it was lust with his indiscretion with Bathsheba. That was from his lust. But then he was fearful of getting caught, of being exposed as an adulterer. That led him into murder. His fear of getting caught was a slimy pit. He spent time trying to extricate himself from that, trying to get out of it, and it got worse. He spent a lot of time running away from King Saul. Saul, out of jealousy, tried to kill him twice. So he became a fugitive, running away from Saul in fear. Another slimy pit, another bog. Grief can be a pit. You can be in grief from the death of a loved one. Most of us have experienced grief. Things go wrong or they don't go the way we expect them to go. I remember a man who lost his job unexpectedly. They gave him a pink slip and, and he lost his job. He had a heart attack and died before he got home. Remember him and Dubois? We, we knew his daughter. He worked for Rockwell. He was in the office. Remember that? Is it coming back? <laughs> well, it was 60 years ago. <laughs> he died. His family was in double grief. They lost their beloved father and husband and also the family breadwinner. Grief. I still miss our beloved Margie. I still miss her. Still think about her often. And I only knew her for a couple of years, but she had such a way about her, you know. I still miss Rodney. He was such a gentle person had such a gentle way about him and when he first went into the nursing home Carol and I would go over there we would take communion and he didn't know who we were at that point he couldn't didn't recognize who we were he said are you from the church <laughs> but when we started praying he started praying in tongues there was nothing wrong with his spirit Rodney I still miss him grief but God is good. He brings us out of the pit. Even Jesus experienced grief. Think of Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus, who is dead four days in the grave. In the King James, it says he stinketh. He was a graveyard dead. He was very dead. He was extra dead. 
and Jesus said, "Where? Show me. Show me where you. Show me where you've laid him." And then John eleven thirty five, Jesus wept. Grief touched the heart of Jesus, who was God. He was a friend of Lazarus. That was his friend. And the grief of his sisters touched the heart of Jesus. God's with us in the pit, even in the pit of grief that we all go through. We're made in the image of God. We see in ourselves the emotions of God. God has and is love. God has anger. God can be grieved. Matthew 23, 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who uh, those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Jesus spoke this after Matthew 23. It's called the seven woes of Matthew 23. And it reveals the grief of rejection. The grief that rejection caused Jesus. We see Jesus in the garden suffering so much grief that his sweat was like drops of blood. He was fully human and fully divine. He was and is God and he understands our grief. Sin is a pit. That's the one David was in. A slippery-sided, muck-bottom pit. On our own power, it's, own, it's our own power that got us in, but on our, on our own power, we can't escape the pit of sin. We can't escape it on our own power. That's what it says in Romans chapter 3. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. We all start out that way. We all start out in that category that we're all sinners. It continues in verse 13. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways and the way of peace they do not know. There's no fear of God before their eyes. No fear of God, no respect for him is the way of the world. And it's a slimy pit of destruction. I go fishing in a stream, or it's a river, it's the Susquehanna River, also in the Juniata. And you never know what you're going to encounter. Plenty of obstacles. There's boulders to trip over. Really slippery in places. You, there's places in the, in the Susquehanna River where I can be standing knee deep and the person next to me can be up to their neck in the water. It used to be really good bass fishing down there because of all those obstacles and boulders. You can trip over them. Last year, I always trip over them. <laughs> Last year, I fell twice in the Juniata. And the one time I fell on my back. You don't want to fall on your back when you're my age because it's hard to turn over. And I couldn't get right. And my life vest kept me from drowning, but I had a hard time getting turned over so I could push up and get back on my feet. Obstacles, and there are mucky places. Sometimes along the edge of the river, the water carries silt and it builds up there and it'll be muck. 
And I've been in those places where it's hard to get out of the muck. It's not quicksand, but it kind of feels like that. There's rocks under there somewhere, but there's nothing firm to stand on. I was in the muck like that in the little in the in the little Juniata last year. And there's other places where there's muck. But life is full of mucky places. If you haven't been in one of those, you will. <laughs> If you haven't been in a mucky place emotionally or spiritually, you will. The worst one is a pit of sin. The sinful life, the life before conversion. And that's where we all were before we encountered Christ. So what did David do about this muck that he was in? First, he recognized he was in the pit. We can't get help from God until we acknowledge our trouble, the pit, our sin, our need of salvation. And then he stood on the rock. Not only did, did, did God give David a rock to stand on, but he was the rock. Because this isn't a physical, this is a physical allegory but he, but he was the rock and he's our rock he's our firm place he's our firm foundation the song goes on our own we can't stand on our rock that is Jesus we stand secure no one no storm of life no grief can knock us off of the rock of ages. We stand firm in our faith, no matter what. Rock of ages, that's a good song we should sing. We don't sing that one anymore. We should sing that sometime. Next, he waited, it says, patiently. When we're in a pit, in a bog, we don't like to wait. <laughs> Oh, Lord, come quickly to save me from this situation. Come quickly. Remember, Jesus took his time to come to Lazarus. He was only two miles away. They sent word, our brother is sick. And he waited on purpose until Lazarus was in the tomb. He waited to bring glory to God because he knew what he was going to do. He knew he was going to bring Lazarus out of the grave. Everything we experience with God is to bring glory to God. We exist to bring glory to God. That's the purpose of our existence. Carol's mother used to get frustrated when they were living with us. I don't know why God put me on this earth. And I said, he put you here to bring glory to him, to praise him. I don't think it's sunk in real well. Psalm 40, 11 to 13, David continues. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. For troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me, and I cannot see. There are more than the hairs of my head, and my heart fails within me. That's a description of what he was in, trouble and sin. Trouble and sin. He was not able to emerge from either one on his own power. He's pleading with God. Once we recognize that we're in sin and uh, the trouble we are in because of sin, we go to God in humility and repentance. And he's quick to forgive us. Then in verse 13, it says, Be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. Here we have that quickly again. Verse 1 says that he waited patiently. <laughs> 
But God is sovereign in all things. He will lift us from the pit when it brings glory to him. He will heal us when it brings the most glory to him. He will bring us from this life into the next. What a blessed time that is. We don't look at that as a blessed time, but it is. Then in verse 17, but as for me, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. He starts out saying he waited patiently, but now he's saying, come to me quickly and do not delay. That's the weakness of the human. That's his weakness. David's going toward God and away from his troubles. He's giving God the glory for doing what he was unable to do on his own power. He could not. And we cannot extricate ourselves from the sin pit. Only God could do that. Jesus came to offer himself as the perfect sacrifice, the spotless lamb, purchasing our redemption, paying the penalty for our sins. He sets us free from the law of sin and death. He lifted us out of the miry clay, out of the pit. He's our rock. He's our firm place to stand. He's our firm foundation. We have a common enemy. Satan and his demons are the enemy. They will set pitfalls on every path. With David, it was lust. And then the fear of being found out. He was found out by Nathan the prophet. He was known out, he was known by God, but Nathan is the one who brought that to him. If he had continued on the sin path that he was on, he could have killed the prophet. The prophet knows what I did. Instead, he repented. David was a, a, an example of a repenter. He spent seven days in sackcloth on the ground. His sin overwhelmed him. What he had done to his friend. And Uriah the Hittite was one of his closest 30, um, like a palace guard, like his elite troops, one of the 30. He knew who he was, and he knew who Bathsheba was, and he knew whose house that was. And Bathsheba knew where he was. She was complicit in all that, too. But what he had done to his friend and to his own child became real to him. His sin pressed heavily on him. He was in a pit that he couldn't get out of. He was in grief. He was in despair. But God ministered to him. And then he worshipped. 2 Samuel 12, 20, Then David got up from the ground. This was after seven days of laying there in, in grief and in repentance. After he had washed, he put on lotions and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request, they served him food, and he ate. He was out of the pit, and all was well. Finally, he had forgiveness. He still had the sin to think of the rest of his life that he had done. God is so good that we're in a, when we get into a mess, <laughs> a pit of our own making, he lifts us out of it. He gives us a firm foundation to stand on. He is that foundation. Our best move is to stay out of the pit in the first place. That sin pit, that is. 
it's our best move to stay out of it in the first place. But we're all human. We all fail. So we go to God in repentance and he lifts us up. Proverbs 4, starting with verse 23. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. We have to watch that we're not getting in to sin. Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. We're to think about what we're saying before those words escape. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet. And be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. He blesses us with a light that shines unto our feet. Uh, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. In that scripture, the light, the lamp is where we are, where our feet are. And the light illuminates the path where we're going. There's no provision in that scripture for seeing what's behind us. That's already done. Where we're going is what's important. And where we're standing is what's important. But you can't just stay there. You can't just stand there. You might start sinking. <laughs> you got to move. And the path has boulders in it. And pitfalls that the enemy puts there. To, de to derail us. And to stop us from accomplishing what God wants us to do. Amen. Amen. What we're going to do is have a closing song. We're back to the river. <laughs> and I would like you to all come down and gather around here where we sing this closing song. It's only a couple minutes.